Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Warman, and I am in the uh, music department. Uh, one of the things I do is work with the instrumental uh, music ed preparation. Um, and I want to thank you for coming and taking the time to support these students and our efforts in preparing them for the music education profession. Um, I think I'll hold off on the individual uh, self-introductions until we get to the first question, then you can say who you are and that'll give us more context. So, uh, well, we've been fortunate this year to have six music MATs. Um, and there are two band, two string, and two vocal. Um, so, <laughs> so with that, um, and also they, there's a diverse interest and experience in elementary, middle, and high school. So we've really covered the full spectrum of the music ed um, world. Um, so because of this diversity, and also because of the uh, somewhat conversational nature of this uh, particular collection, um, we decided to do a panel discussion in lieu of the individual uh, presentations. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I think what you'll hear is that um, the diversity of settings and experiences, but through that you'll also sense some commonalities in terms of how they grow um, and also the, the, how they uh, would react to the things that they that they encountered. Um, I think you'll also come away this morning uh, that each of these students has evolved and developed during the year, um, and they're now fully prepared to enter the education profession. But I think also you'll find that effective and successful teachers come in many different forms, that they don't look all the same, they don't act all the same, but they're effective nonetheless. And it's through this diversity that we keep the interest uh, in our profession. So uh, we have a couple set questions, um, and that should open up some dialogue, and then we will also have some opportunity for questions for you all. And so to, to highlight the diversity element, we'll have each of our interns briefly describe the settings of their internships in the spring, including the modeling and interactions of their mentor teachers, and also provide some insight into how this context informed decisions they made as educators. And the question here was, what did the students teach you? So we'll start with Kristen, and you can introduce yourself and go on. All right, my name is Kristen Burnham. I am a vocalist doing studying elementary music. I started my semester finishing my placement at the elementary level at Hebner Elementary. Hebner is in Northeast Independent School District. Um, it is a more, is a higher socioeconomic area um, not as much diversity as some of the other campuses in Northeast. Northeast kind of has a wide array of schools. After I did my first five weeks there, I finished off this semester at Luna Middle School in Northside ISD. The school's a bit more diverse, um, about the same, probably a little bit lower economic status. So I was working with very different kids and also it was just a very different age group. So moving from where I was at the elementary school, I'd known these kids, I'd been with them since August. I had really good relationships with them. They knew me from the very beginning, worked hard to establish those. It was a very structured program. I only got to see them once a week, maybe twice a week if they were happened to be there on a Friday. So the relationship aspect was different, having to work on it, seeing them once a week and slowly building that. And what does that look like, but then also maintaining this intense structure of the Kodai classroom. Um, and once I got to the middle school, it was very different to all of a sudden see my students every single day. <laughs> and sometimes I was like, I'm not used to this. Um, but it was so nice for me <coughs> to have that because it really aided in building those relationships because I feel like that's one of the most important aspects of being a teacher is those relationships. That's what's going to help you with your classroom management. That's what's going to help you just understand your students and communicate with them. So seeing them every day was very beneficial. Um, and it was interesting working with just seeing the different kinds of students because when you're in the middle school you have various levels of interest in the program. Everyone's there because they want to be. Some people, especially in choir, just get thrown in. So you have those who don't want to be there. And interacting with those, 
people who are in maybe a non-varsity choir versus a varsity choir and how does that look and how do you model your expectations for both of those choirs so that they're still high but you're matching the needs of the student. In the varsity choir it was more about they want an intense musical experience and they're all seeking um, high levels of understanding and musicianship as well as that camaraderie that comes with an ensemble. In the non-varsity choir, it was slightly different. The girls liked music, they enjoyed it, they thought it was fun, they wanted to sing, but maybe they didn't care as much about, oh, I want to be singing three parts a cappella all the time, and they wanted that, it really craved that social aspect. So structuring the classroom and the lessons so that individual needs were met. Um, I don't great. know if that's like that. Anybody else want to follow up? Jordan. What? Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for volunteering. Okay. <laughs> My name is Jordan Sheffield. I am an orchestral instrumental music education person. I took two internships this year. I had an 18-week elementary internship. Uh, in that time, I created my own fifth grade strings uh, class at the uh, at the elementary school. Oh, by the way, it was Salinas Elementary and Judson ISD. Um, the it was a slightly lower socioeconomic uh, level than I was probably used to. It has a lot of military families, a lot of moving students coming in, going out, a lot of uh, students with emotional and behavioral disorders. Um, but I still thought they were great kids. And uh, the program was a very wonderful experience for me. The, uh, the students there really taught me how to open up and connect with uh, them in a way that made their learning more beneficial. Um, they, I, before these internships, thought that, OK, I'm going to have this lesson plan. I'm going to structure it, and then I'm going to teach it, and then they're going to get it. And, <laughs> and that's not how it works. So um, working with these students and really um, learning, oh, they have other needs besides just that, and learning how to best cater to them uh, so that they can learn as best as they possibly can was probably the biggest thing that I got out of that internship, uh, as well as learning how to start an entire program from scratch, uh, which was the, probably one of the best experiences that I've had so far. Um, then I had a 14-week <coughs> internship at Lopez Middle School in Northeast ISD. Uh, I was working under Melanie Sorgi, and we had eight, no, yes, seven different orchestra classes, uh, and then two after-school strings classes for fifth graders. And um, these levels ranged all the way from beginners uh, to very advanced students who had been playing since they were three years old. Um, and learning, the biggest thing I took away from those students was probably um, how, learning how to cope with such a diverse group in one 45 minute period. Um, it's not easy, but it's definitely doable. And uh, I was always very worried, like if I'm catering to these students, won't the students that are bright or a little more ahead get bored and disinterested? That's not necessarily the case. There are definitely still ways to keep them engaged. Um, and that's, that's really what I took away from those experiences. Is that what you wanted me to say? That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, it's, all, it's all about me, isn't it? Uh, Sean, why don't you go next? So, to, I, I'm band, instrumental, focus, uh, but this semester I started out at Bulverde Creek Elementary School, which was quite an experience. I uh, am not the type to really enforce and in getting into a line, uh, and so that was different. You had to be in a line, you had to follow these procedures, and that was different for me, and having to adapt was definitely one of those things in elementary school. Uh, but a great program uh, under Amanda Morris and Chelsea Short, who's a graduate here of Trinity University, uh, MAT program for uh, five years ago, I don't remember. And, and so I, that was a program, uh, high socioeconomic level, the, all the support you can imagine from administration. They had the class structure they, they, they needed. They saw their kids three and a half times a week. Some weeks they saw four, some weeks they saw three. Uh, for 25 minute classes, and which is perfect for what you want in a music classroom. And they had a great ORF ensemble, which again is our um, keyboard, small keyboard instruments that we teach uh, our young students, as well as just great, uh, a great choir, fifth and fourth grade choir that I think was about 160 strong 
at the beginning of the semester. And so just a huge program uh, feeding into Tex Hill, which feeds into the Johnson High School, north of 1604 suburb area of San Antonio. And then I went back to the high school, uh, back to 7 a.m. rehearsals and <laughs> kids that are much taller. <laughs> And uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure if they're nicer or not nicer, but <laughs> they are and they aren't. Um, but it definitely a different, just different culture at Madison High School. Uh, it's still in Northeast. Uh, really, the schools are only separated by, I would guess, three, two and a half miles, three miles. But socioeconomic levels vastly different. Uh, you're, you're pulling from just different audiences there. Uh, but the program has been built uh, for years. The directors have been there. Two of the directors have been there for at least, uh, one's been there for what, six, seven years. The other one's been there since like the Stone Ages. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> they, they've, they've been able to build a program there. They're, uh, they've, gosh, they have about 300 strong in the band. Uh, so it's a huge, one, one of the biggest programs in Texas, I would say. And, and just great facilities, a great attitude from directors onto the students as well as expectations, and this is the first year, uh, and they're quite proud of this first year, they got straight ones and everything from marching UIL to all their three performing ensemble. So it's kind of neat to be part of that experience as well, as seeing the progression of each, the personality of each director and how they uh, perceive their class and expectations for their class and how they met those goals. That was, was vastly different. So it's kind of cool to see three different personalities in one school there. Very good. Katie, why don't you come in? I'm Katie Yachnich. I started off the year at the Montessori School of San Antonio. It's probably the wealthiest elementary school we have, not just in San Antonio, but probably the surrounding area as well. <clears throat> the tuition starts off very high for three and four year olds and scaffolds its way up into middle school by quite a bit. I think it ends at about 10,000 a year per student by the time they get to middle school. Um, I was privileged to get to see my students, my music students, three or four times a week, which is very unusual at the elementary level to do that. It, it was highly structured. It was a Kodai program. And, but because we saw the students so much, we had about 24 lesson plans a week for a normal week to do that. And so by the end of it, I was pretty proficient in turning them out. <laughs> so, um, I learned a lot from those kids. I had never worked with such a high socioeconomic background, and it was, it was different. Parent expectations were different, and some school expectations with that were different. And, but I learned a lot from the kids, and they, they always came very willing to learn. They were very open to music because of the Montessori philosophy in that program. Their classroom structures were very different from an ordinary, from a normal public school system. And so I think that created a more openness than you would find in a normal elementary music program. Sorry, Nora, can, can you <coughs> expand on that a little bit? Just sure. for everyone in the audience, what makes Montessori different? Montessori's, uh, the Montessori school is, uh, creates a more open classroom where that is based on exploring and children testing their own boundaries and finding their way via exploring and creativity. So they have a set list of tasks and they can tackle it in how, you know, there's some structure, especially at the lower levels and it gets a little more free as they go up. A task list of things to go and the, the basic skills of math and science and reading are built into them, but they also incorporate things like music and projects and all the classrooms had at least two pets in them um, that they would have to take care of. Manners was a big part of the classroom. They all had classroom chores, even washing like cloth napkins, which they would practice with using and folding and stuff that they built in life skills into that, into those task lists that they would tackle every week. And it creates for a more free environment to, to explore what you're good at and what you like as a, as a student. And even at the elementary level, I think we find that often students, especially as the elders, start to resent, like, why, why do we have to take music? What's the point? And I didn't find that resentment in, until 
I got to my like eighth graders, you know, <laughs> at the Montessori school. I didn't see any of that until about that age group. So it was, it kind of put it off a little bit. And which is expected by the time they were eighth graders, they only had general music. So I can understand, you know, they, they would see their friends doing band and choir and orchestra at other schools, and that's not something that's developed there yet. Uh, I moved to Eisenhower Middle School. I was there from mid-October to the end of January. It's in Northeast ISD. It's a more diverse program, more so than it used to be. It's becoming more and more diverse, and it's also gaining a dual language program. They've, they were It was in its trial year this year, and so that's something they're going to continue. And so that was very different, working with a lot more ELL students in the choir room. So I learned. Um, I learned a lot about using visual cues and um, using a, a, a bit of my piano skills to, because orally, <laughs> orally it makes more sense and if I could have them watch what I'm doing on the piano and then follow it on a whiteboard with staff, it made a little more sense to them visually than me trying to explain what do, re, mi is because if they're trying to learn ABC when they speak Spanish, do, re, mi doesn't mean anything to them yet. Uh, so that was that was a challenge, but it was a fun challenge to take on with those students. Um, is a very, a very well established program with two full time choir directors at the middle school level, which is unusual. Um, and their 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 program does very well. It's one of the I think it's the second biggest choir program at the middle school level in Northeast. And I learned a lot about structure and about how to get students in the classroom, a lot of students in a small classroom and doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's an old school, so our facilities were not too big. <laughs> I moved to Churchill High School after that, um, which is just down the road from Eisenhower. Eisenhower is one of its feeder schools, which was very unique to, to be able to go from a feeder school to its, to its counterpart down the road and see how the programs influence each other. <clears throat> And I was, I was only at Churchill for about three weeks, <laughs> actually. Um, and I got to work with the students on some one-on-one -on -one level. I got to work with them and coaching them through solo and ensemble. Through solos, I got to work with the show choir a little bit, which was w really different, but a lot of fun. Um, and then helping with some after-school rehearsals. They were getting ready for a Europe tour. Um, and then I, I got my job offer that I'm at right now, and so I moved to Spring Branch, and that's where I've been ever since. Wonderful. Thank you. Maria. <coughs> okay. uh, well, I started the year uh, at Ed White Middle School in Northeast ISD. Uh, it's a Title I middle school with a band program there. Um, I'm band emphasis. Um, <coughs> And that was kind of, I've been all over the map. Um, <laughs> so I started there, and then this semester I started at Langley Elementary in Northside, which is, if you know San Antonio, it's like out 90 past Petranco. It's way out there. Um, but so it's um, more of a higher socioeconomic status. Um, they actually had a lot of military families, so a lot of students coming in and out. Um, but the music teacher there, Pam Goodenough, she's been there since the school opened in 2007. Uh, so it's a very established program. The administration teachers are all very supportive of each other. Uh, while I was there, we actually found out the vice principal became principal of another school. So in a week, we put together a program for her, and that was all kinds of challenging. We had to call the choir back and teach music in five days. They learned three songs by memory in five days, which was kind of cool to see for fourth and fifth graders. And then we started a percussion club once a week. Yeah, so that was something for me interesting as an, as an instrumentalist. Uh, I wasn't as great with the choir kids, but uh, I can do percussion. <laughs> I can do orc instruments, and we did a lot of uh, improvising, and they actually wrote some of their own music, and I, I um, also taught recorder for the fourth graders. Um, and then my last week there, my mentor was in a car accident on her way to school. And so I walked in the office and they said, you have to teach, because <laughs> Pam's not coming in. <laughs> Uh, thankfully, we had already had the lesson plans ready to go, and so I just jumped into it. And I think that's the biggest thing I learned from the elementary level was you have to be prepared. Because any downtime, they are gone. You lose their attention, and it's so hard to get back. Uh, you, you can't just stand there. I'm a very passive person, 
and that doesn't work with elementary students. <laughs> 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 I learned a lot about raising my energy level, uh, kind of raising my voice sometimes, but just getting their attention and holding it for a 45 minute class is kind of a struggle. We, saw, we only saw our kids once every six days, but we did have 45 minute classes, so we had a lot to cram in every week, and they learned a lot. Um, after Langley, I went to Southwest High School, and I had been there last semester, I ended both semesters there, um, and it's quite a different school. It's a 6A high school. It, Currently, it's the only school in their district, their only high school, but they're building a new one. They just started, they just broke ground on it recently. Um, but it's 90% Hispanic. So it was uh, quite different from Langley Elementary, which um, I think it was about 70% Hispanic um, and about 20% white. Um, but Southwest was a huge program. Uh, one thing about them is they actually have a separate ninth grade campus. Um, and the the way the, the school is laid out is everything is pretty much all in one space. Even the, the district offices are all on the same campus. And so we would drive from the main high school campus to the ninth grade campus every day. And they had um, two ninth grade ensembles and a ninth grade jazz band and a separate ninth grade director that stayed mostly at that school. So it was a lot of traveling back and forth and working with a lot of different students. Um, I did a lot of my work with the, the third band, with the upperclassmen, and then the ninth grade students. Um, and as me, actually, I uh, prefer middle school, and so working with the ninth graders was a good kind of age transition. They still have a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, um, there are a couple of times where the, the ninth grade director had to go to class. She was earning, um, I think, her master's degree in administration, and so she would go to class on uh, one day a week, and I would run the jazz band in the afternoons for her. Um, so it was just a lot of hands-on experience and just working with uh, especially with the upperclassmen, kids who didn't <coughs> want to be there for the music, they were there for the social aspect of it. So figuring out how to get their interest and still make quality music was quite a challenge. But uh, I think by the end of it, they at least accepted that they were there to play music. <laughs> and their the performance was, I was really proud of them. Hi, I'm Selena Irby. And I spent all of the fall semester at Thornton Elementary, which was actually the elementary school that I went to as a kid. So I was with my own music teacher that I've known since I was five years old. We're like lifelong friends, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it was really amazing seeing on the other side, seeing her as um, a colleague rather than just as my own teacher. I mean, she did teach me along the way. I learned so much um, through working with her. She gave me a lot of hands-on experience, basically let me teach all the time. She would go hide in the closet while I taught. <laughs> she just listened at the door, made sure I wasn't crashing and burning. And even if I was, she'd let me do it. Um, so I had a great experience there. We were on a six-day rotation and had to see every kid in the school, and I did not get to learn everyone's names, <laughs> but um, that's not really possible at the elementary level. Um, I went back to visit recently, too, and I, all the kids were like, Miss Ubi, Miss Ubi, and I'm like, you? <laughs> I recognize all their faces, their names, they just oozed out of my ear, so. Um, because this past semester I was at Peace Middle School with Christy Armand, um, and that's a Title I middle school, so um, very low socioeconomic status, very different from my elementary placement where the kids are, are a little more well off, so. Um, in fact, the orchestra room at Peace is not actually an orchestra room. In all of Northside School District, we have, we're the only school that doesn't actually have an orchestra room. It's just a regular classroom that we somehow managed to fit a whole bunch of kids and instruments in. I don't know how we do it, but we do. And um, even so, um, Chris Drummond is an excellent um, orchestra director, and I feel very fortunate to have been able to work with him. I'm, I was really lucky because both of my mentors became Teachers of the Year this past school year. So that just really goes to show that I got very lucky um, with my placements. Um, he's very tech savvy. So um, I used a lot of the, like, I always had my computer on the stand in front of me and I was playing the tracks from like their Essential Elements book every day and um, before school, every single day we'd go to Hatchet Elementary right down the street for um, before school fifth grade strings, which I thought was a really good idea because in my experience before I was only doing after school strings and fifth graders are wild after school. So I'm like, yeah, I feel like I would like, I'd prefer that. I want to have my kids in the morning before school when they're calm and tired. <laughs> so, um, but Chris, um, he introduced me to um, more of the Suzuki method of, of teaching um, string instruments, which is 
playing by ear, learning by ear. So we play the kids some music and they'd had to play it back. So they didn't ever actually get to learn how to read music. That's gonna be his job next year when they go to middle school to teach them how to read music. Um, I, I think in my own um, fifth grade strings program that I plan on forming, I would do a little incorporation of both Suzuki and introducing notes at the same time that way, making an easier transition to middle school where they had to learn how to read music. Uh, but that helped me significantly in my own private teaching because I, I give private lessons like cello or violin lessons. And um, I always, I, now I start teaching my kids through ear, by ear and like play this back to me. And so that really helps them a lot. And, and I'm also a bigger proponent on perfect posture. Posture, good posture leads to good tone. So that's my ultimate thing for all of my students now. All the things I didn't notice before teaching them, I'm like, oh, sorry, I didn't catch that before. That's, that's really bad. <laughs> so keeping the wrist straight, keeping the nice bow hold, everything nice and perfect, and they're more successful that way. So he really, really helped me a lot in how I teach and um, approach string teaching. So I'm um, hoping to get a position as an elementary teacher and with the strengths program so that I can really help those kids um, progress into middle school and not just focus on the strings, but get my students fo um, ready for middle school in general, whether they go into band, choir, or orchestra. So right now I'm interviewing <coughs> with Northside Schools and <laughs> hoping for the best. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the, the next question, we, you know, we, we, we try to stress that the uh, teaching activity is reflective and reflexive. Um, and uh, so I've asked each of the students to think about this, to reflect on the process of the internship and to identify what they've learned um, through all of the experiences that you just briefly heard about um, as a teacher. So the question here is what did you teach you? Um, I, I want to roll another question in because there wasn't time to address it, but all of you mentioned socioeconomic settings uh, in your schools. And um, so one of the things I'm curious about is um, what similarities and differences you observed and how the socioeconomic setting may have affected choices that you made or things that you discovered uh, as a result that you didn't expect on one, one end or the other, knowing that on one level kids are kids, but on another very important level, there are pretty significant differences that challenge teachers and students both. So if anybody wants to jump in, and this can be more <coughs> conversational now that we've all heard you individually. I'll start with this. Thank you. Um, I guess I would compare White, which was a Title I middle school, with Southwest High School, which is uh, a little bit higher socioeconomic status. Um, one thing I saw with White was the kids don't really have a lot of, one, they had uniforms, so there wasn't an issue about, you know, comparing clothes and the shoes were their big thing. They all, like, had fancy <laughs> shoes, but it was weird. Um, but thinking about those students and how some of them, they, the whole school was pre-reduced lunch, so they didn't have to worry about that. But you know, some of them you could tell, like they come in on Monday and they haven't eaten much over the weekend. And then with Southwest, they, they did a lot of field trips and a lot of activities where anytime they went out somewhere, the students had to pay money. And it was never a problem getting money from them. And uh, I noticed especially just the, the difference in the students' attitudes. Um, with, with White, um, we had a, a trip planned, we actually got rained out to go to one of the high school football games. And the students were so excited about it because they don't get to go on a lot of trips because they don't have the fundraising to do that. Um, where at Southwest it's just a normal thing. It's like, oh, we're hopping on a bus tomorrow, I might bring my clothes. You know, they, they don't really even think about planning ahead for that. Um, so just seeing the difference in the students' attitude um, as well as the parental involvement you know, at Southwest, parents were all over the place. They had a very strong booster program. Um, the boosters raised a lot of the money for the entire program. Uh, you know, any given day, we might see a parent at the school. <coughs> Where at White, you know, the parents are, they're busy with other things. They're trying to take care of their family, and um, they're just not, they don't have time to be around as much. So how did that impact Oh, wait, person, teaching. yes, gotcha. Um, I think just knowing where the students are, or where they're coming from, their, their home situation, um, you've got to open a dialogue with the students, not just looking at the school statistics and the neighborhood surrounding, but knowing each individual student, you know, maybe one student can't afford to pay the band fee, and you can't just say, oh, you can't pay the fee, you're out of band. You have to figure out why they can't pay it. You know, even at, at Southwest, there were some students who were in that situation, and knowing what's going on with their family life, and just knowing that they can trust you, and they can be honest with you to say, I can't afford to pay it, my family can't pay it, than having myself a solution to figure out, okay, we're going to do something else to keep you in this program. 
Right. I, go ahead. Yeah, I'll go. Um, so I worked with fifth graders at both of my internships. So when I really try to compare my internships, I really only compare it. Well, the biggest comparison to me is the fifth graders. Um, and I think the best way to show is just tell the story uh, at my, at Mead Elementary, not Mead, at Salinas Elementary. Um, one of my students in my fifth grade strings class was having trouble remembering her instrument and um, practicing. So I had to sit down and talk to her because um, one of, as part of our contract is if you're not practicing, if you're forgetting to bring your instrument, you can't be in the strings program. Uh, so I sat down and I talked to her. I was like, what can I do to help you? Why, why are you keeping forgetting your stuff? She's like, well, my mom leaves work in the morning at about 4 a.m. And my grandmother tries to sleep in for a little bit. So I'm the one who has to wake up and get my five-year-old brother ready for school. I have to feed him breakfast. I have to make sure we both get on the bus. I have to, I have to take care of him. So I'm much more busy helping him out. And sometimes I forget my homework or my instrument and stuff like that. So uh, with her, I made a specific schedule and a lot of different reminders uh, in order to help her not only take care of her brother, but take care of herself. And I started working very closely with her grandmother in order to make sure she was getting what she needed. At, um, in my other fifth grade strings programs, when I was at Lopez, I saw one girl crying one day and I asked her what was wrong. And uh, she said, well, I can't decide if I want to go to the strings concert or my friend's birthday party. And I looked at her and I was like, if this is your one biggest concern in the world, I feel very bad for you. <laughs> You're in for a surprise later. Um, it, and that, that level of concern, uh, I would say, is standard for both of those schools. A lot of the students at Salinas Elementary are worried about making sure their other siblings are uh, getting ready to go in the morning or making sure that they're getting things done because their parents can't take care of them. Whereas uh, in the Lopez area, they have time to be concerned with more frivolous things because their parents are taking care of the things that m the other students don't get taken care of with. Um, their parents are making sure that they're fed in the morning. Their parents are making sure they get to the places they need to be. Um, uh, and this has really impacted me, again, um, with a sense of you need to be very knowledgeable about the place that you're in. Um, when you are in a program such as Lopez, and yes, you have great parent involvement and the socioeconomic standard is very high, that means you can do many, many things, but also you should not assume that every single student is like that because um, one of my sixth graders uh, could not go to Solon Ensemble or almost didn't go to Solon Ensemble because she couldn't find a ride because her parents weren't going to take her and um, other things like that. She didn't have a proper dress. She ended up wearing an Elsa costume because uh, that was her Halloween costume and her parents couldn't afford to buy her a, a nice dress to wear to solo and ensemble um, and other things like that. Uh, so you need to be aware of the surrounding culture that your school is in, but also be aware very individually about your students and uh, making sure whatever their needs are that they're being met, whether it's making sure that they are remembering to take care of themselves and their brother or helping them figure out that they should be going to the orchestra concert and not their friend's birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel along the same lines as what Jordan and Maria have said, a lot of it is a case-by-case -case basis. At Luna, it was more just middle of the road. It wasn't either extreme. I mean, we had a bunch of military families, so kids were coming and going a lot. Um, but as much as the program could, just so there wasn't that stress on the students and the parents, they paid for things. Mm -hmm. They paid for entry fees and things like that so that one student didn't feel different from the others. So it wasn't as obvious. And the times came where students were expected to pay. We just had open and frank conversations and made it okay. Like, if you have a struggle paying for this, come talk to us privately. We'll work it out. And then also letting the other students know, some of you don't just tell me I can't afford it because you don't want to ask your parents or because you forgot and so now you're going to just take a free ride and talking about the importance of that of supporting one another because they're in that ensemble together and building that. So being in the program <coughs> and being able to help out students where you can and then being understanding and I know one of the things that I didn't expect to see because of the programs I was in had this, they had a whole ton of black dress shoes, black socks, everything like that. So for a competition day, we had kids come in who were like, 
I don't have black shoes, or beforehand they would tell us, I don't have black shoes, I can't get black shoes. And we're like, that's okay, wear some of ours. Um, and we would give them some socks, so we'd give them shoes, and we'd provide those things for them so it wasn't a stress, so it would be more about the music, which I think is, you know, number one goal. They're not there to stress and worry about, am I in the correct uniform? Yes, you have the uniform to look professional when you're on stage and things like that, and it helps them get into the right mindset of a performance, but you don't want that to hinder their performance if they're stressing about things like that. So if you can work your program to support these kids in easy ways, I think they just probably took up a donation and got shoes, went to a Goodwill and bought a bunch of sizes. Um, it's extremely helpful for the kids so that they can focus on what they need to. So for me, I, I would argue uh, that it was very much, while socioeconomically my placements were very different, um, I, my, both my middle and elementary placements were again very high socioeconomic level, and my high school placement was probably lower middle class uh, pla a, a placement. At the same time, that's the clientele that you're, you're facing, uh, the, the programs fostered a community that did, it, just, it, it didn't really make that much of a difference, I would argue. It does make a difference in how you approach things, uh, and I don't want to deny that fact, but all the programs had a huge amount of parental involvement. Um, you know, finances were there available for students. There were still people who had trouble with finances in higher socioeconomic levels. And there were, I mean, and so while yes, the clientele was different in all schools, especially at Madison High School, in a lot of ways, I got to see that experience, what, taught, what it taught me. Um, since we're getting to that question, what it taught me <laughs> Thank you. was that you can foster a program even though you're dealing with a community that maybe has tough with uh, monetary issues. You can still foster a positive community with parent involvement, with fundraising, with a huge booster program, with, and just a welcoming environment. And you can do that at a school like Madison um, and really get the same results, same results as any other school. Did any of you have either epiphany-like discoveries or surprises along the way that <coughs> may have altered? Well, yeah, um, working in the Title I school this past semester, I didn't realize how much these kids worry about money on a daily basis. And you, and you came to observe and you saw that yourself. Um, uh, towards the end of the semester, the kids had to, if they wanted to partake in one of the concerts um, with Mark Wood from the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, he's going on tour. And, that's all done with. That was just last week. <laughs> it was crazy. But um, they all had to buy t-shirts and that was their ticket to get into the concert. I think the t-shirts were like $15 or something like the like. And so, and one of the students was like, I don't know about you guys, but that's a lot of money. Like that's, so, um, you know, that was a struggle for them to get the money to do that. And, um, and none of my students take private lessons. No, that is not even an option for them. That is money, that's expensive. And I compare it to my own experience when I was in middle school. Right? I came from a, a well-off family, and my, the school I was at, which is Rudder Middle School, which has now actually become a Title I school. But you know, so at any school, you're going to have the low and high socioeconomic steps for every, no matter what the school actually is labeled as. You're going to get, you're going to see it all. So, but at the school I was at, um, at the time, a lot of my classmates took private lessons, and we had a really good orchestra program, a lot of strong players. At Peace, none of them take private lessons, but we still have those students that are so motivated. So no matter where you go, you're going to have that same kind of motivation from your students. I, there are some kids in that program that I, I can already tell they're going to be like, I can see them in symphonies when they're older. Like the sixth grader, Glenn, I just love him so much. He's a bass player. He just started this year, and he is phenomenal. He's a tiny little kid, and he's just like ripping it. He's awesome. <laughs> um, he's just way ahead of all of his classmates. He just keeps learning the new music because he just loves it so much. And he's never taken any lessons in his life. He has like a little keyboard at his house and he taught himself the Charlie Brown theme song just by ear. Like he's just a really musical person. So and there, there's a few kids like that in the program. And <clears throat> even without private lessons, I know they'll, they'll be okay because they have that motivation. But it's just, it's really interesting to see um, the differences from school to school. I think with what Selena is saying, we've been talking a lot about, oh, the socioeconomics, but really what it comes down to is not going to be the money that the kids have and might help them, but that internal motivation, mm -hmm. and are we fostering that motivation in our mm -hmm. classroom to get them excited and engaged in the music so that they want to go home and practice their instruments more because 
practice is what's going to get them there and continuing to build on their skills. Yeah, Kristen's right. There are so many kids who were taking private lessons at my middle school, uh, but they weren't motivated. Mm -hmm. They didn't like playing. It's just their parents are making them do this, mm -hmm. so they weren't really excelling. They were just going through the motions, taking lessons, doing everything that their parents want them to do, mm -hmm. and still not enjoying it. So I think it's, I think Kristen really hit it on the mark. Mm -hmm. To add, I mean, I, my epiphany moment was <laughs> more of was my fourth band. They had never been, I, I would say, that they've never been given the respect that they deserve in terms of what their potential is. And once I finally, they, once they finally saw me buying into them, uh, they, they finally kind of bought into me. And so it was really just that care factor, you know, that you want to be there, that you want them to get better. We want to make music, what a thought, in, in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually, no, it is quite difficult when you, you have to kind of remind them, we're, we're, we're playing music here, you know, we're, <laughs> we're not robots, play music. Yeah. One of the amazing things about Southwest is they actually provide private lessons teachers for all the middle schools and high school. As part of their band fee goes to paying for the teachers. So once a week, all the students theoretically see a private lessons teacher, and that's what their grade is based on. But we still had, in the third band that I saw, I think two students were passing uh, because they just didn't play for the teachers. Um, and so just getting them to turn around their focus and say, okay, not just this is what my grade is based on, but these guys are here to help me be a better musician. Why am I in band? Why not just you know, do a, some other blow off class if you don't want to play music? Um, and actually working with the freshmen, you know, because we had two third periods at the same time, the upperclassmen and the freshmen. So a lot of times the freshmen didn't get to see the private lesson teacher because they were with the older students. And so actually, uh, I worked a lot with them about helping them pass off their scales and all the things that the lesson teachers were supposed to do, either before or after school, I would work with them. And I actually got uh, on my goodbye card from some of my kids, thank you for listening to me play. And the fact that they say that, like it's such a novel thing, really broke my heart. So the final question um, is, how will you apply the lessons you've learned along the way and along maybe with our discussions of music ed philosophy. Um, and the, just in terms of your goals for yourself, for your students, and for the profession, the whole point, uh, theme of this is pivot to professionals, so you're no longer students, you're now professionals. So what are you going to take with you from this experience as you pivot? I'm going to keep in contact with everyone because I still don't know what to do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's okay to admit that too. Yes. Um, because if you really need help, you really should ask for it. Uh, otherwise, your students are going to suffer. And nobody, uh, we're here for our students. Um, if we don't have the answer, somebody else will, for sure. So that's my biggest thing, I think. My biggest fear going into Spring Branch was that we've talked about if you're not prepared enough as a teacher, you revert to the way you were taught. That was my biggest fear going in was that I would do that. I had some doozies of music <laughs> teachers. I had a lot of them <laughs> growing up. Um, and it's right before I started, I had a teacher tell me, there's nothing that prepares you for when the door shuts and it's just you and them. That was <laughs> true. She, she was right in her own way. But I haven't yet had any terrible moment where I'm like, I reverted. I haven't, I've managed to keep what we've learned here for the most part and always keep the students at the center of what I'm doing. Not that everything goes perfectly and there is a, there's been a bit of some, there are days when it's like survival mode <laughs> and I just go, and it, but it happens and it just go, you just go through and as long as the students stay at the center of everything, then everything tends to turn out all right. And if I can remember that, it works a lot better. <laughs> and I don't, I don't feel that fear anymore that I'm going to revert to how I was taught or, any, or bad practices I had growing up as a student. I don't have that fear in myself anymore. And I think part of that is constantly being aware of what's going on and not only just the music community but the education community and melding those things together and constantly being in communication with those around you and reading and things like that. And I know 
I was subbing at Hardy Oak and I was trying to figure out, I had some like key things to getting attention, but these kids apparently had heard these all year long and the teacher didn't have any new ones. And I was slipping through my journal, I found my notes from TMEA and I was like, oh, and I used them and it worked and I was like, oh, professional development. <laughs> <laughs> if you put it into practice, because I, you know, you go to TMEA, you take the notes, you're like, yeah, that's awesome, I'm gonna do it. And then you don't do it because it stays in your journal. So just remember to, put, to go back to those and put them in practice to see how it works. And even just testing it out, you're like, I'm not sure about this, but trying it and see what happens and seeing how your kids respond. And they might not respond the first time, especially if it's something completely different for you and them. It's not natural. They need to keep experiencing it before they're like, ah, this is what we're doing. And I know what I saw at my middle school, especially, you see a lot of choir programs where it's about the performance constantly. Um, and so we, because we're a military school, we had lots of fluctuation with um, students. And one thing that Jessica did well was a lot of assessment at different levels. So the kids were constantly doing singing tests, written theory, along with learning their music. And it wasn't those set grades, it was the working towards mastery. So they had all nine weeks to do these singing tests. Um, and they'd sing for us if they didn't quite get it, send them back with some keys and, okay, work on it. Um, and just and one thing she told me, she's like, if you're going to have them build towards mastery, you make sure they're understanding the skill set and what they're doing. So if it was we're grading on the key of D, I wouldn't have them read the same piece in the key of D every time because then that's just memorizing, and we're trying to work away from memorizing so that they're really getting those things and making it their own. And so I think by trying and seeing that in the classroom and seeing, oh, you can have your students. This is what building towards mastery looks like in a classroom and observing that and taking note of that and trying it out, it's been awesome to witness because sometimes we talk about it in class and we read about it and we hear about it and we're like, yeah, but what does it look like and how do we do this and how do I get buy-in from my students? So it's important just to keep doing it and if it fails, try it again. Don't just shut the door on anything new that's going to help you build as an educator because as you build as an educator, you're building your students to be better students and helping them learn along the way. For me, two and a half things kind of popped out. I don't know why two and a half. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one is, uh, we talked about in the fall, Alfie Cohn, about reward by punishments. Uh, also uh, talked about intrinsic motivation back in the summer. And, uh, and for me, I, being a, a full year into the schools, you really see, and it's kind of quite scary, that students are only really motivated by grades and motivated by assignments that are graded. And if it's not for your learning, then what, what, what are we doing it for um, kind of thing. And so for me, going into uh, my, my teaching year, I want to be able to find a way to motivate these students other than just handing them a grade. Now, obviously, we do have to have grades, but finding just that balance of doing that. And again, I, I talked a little bit more too. Uh, this semester, we talked about William Glasser's philosophy on, uh, especially I, I really hark on the seven habits, seven good habits, and what I don't know what fancy word was seven ha good habits and bad habits essentially. And you really have to embody that as a teacher, as a, as a have good ethics, good morals, and it starts with you. And then that's what the expectation is. Once you set that expectations, your students will meet it. So I get, and that's so the research part of it. The experience part will come with time, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so just building, just counteracting those two, you know, what's your experience, what's the research say, mixing those two together, and then bring that to the next level into being a better teacher every single day. Uh, building off what others have said, I think establishing relationships, not just with your students in the classroom, but your coworkers, and not just other music teachers. I mean, one of the best things that I saw at Wyatt and Langley is we ate lunch in the teacher's lounge every day. So interacting with the other teachers, you're not just isolating yourself. Um, and at Y especially, it helped with a lot of behaviors. You know, we'd have students who have behavior problems or they have behavior contracts. And just getting advice from the other teachers, say, what works with this student in your class? Well, here's what he's doing in my class. And just comparing notes to see <coughs> how to help the student better, not just, you know, because they're students overall. It's not just a music student and a math student. They're a student. Mm -hmm. Um, and so seeing that and even getting ideas from other students. I remember one day at Langley we were having lunch <coughs> and the PE coach was talking about the love and logic classroom management strategy and she was uh, saying she raised her daughter that way. And just hearing personal experience of different ways to help children learn how to be better adults and learn how to just be children in a respectful professional way. And so it's not just 
oh, we let them do whatever they want or we give them consequences. It's, you know, we can help them to make better choices even when they're five years old. And that was one of the greatest things that I learned. Yeah, a lot of teaching, like kind of what Kristen said earlier, is trial and error. It's not going to, a lesson you teach for the first time is not going to go the way you plan. You can't be the greatest lesson planner in the world. Your lesson's not going to go as it's planned. A lesson plan is a great foundation, but um, things happen, especially in my experience in elementary school. I remember when I first started there, I started writing lesson plans. I, I would go through them way too fast. It's like, oh, no, I have 20 minutes left of class. <laughs> you know, so you got to really over plan. And for those kinds of moments, um, I had an interview just last week. And it was uh, in my interview, I actually had to teach a lesson. And it was supposed to be 25 minutes. And so I planned it. And then I added an extra activity just in case I went through everything too fast. And I didn't even get to the extra activity because I've gotten so much better through experience with my pacing. So what you learn is through experience, trial and error. You've got to keep trying, and, and you're going to fail, and you're going to get up, and you're going to try again. The kids will forgive you. It's just, if it's just one lesson, you know, just gotta, you can fix it for next time. So in elementary school, you have like a rotation period, so you only see your kids like once every six days or five days, depending on the school. And so um, I always felt bad for the day one rotation because those kids were always getting my very first time <laughs> lesson, and it never went as planned. So my mentor gave me the great idea of, well, you know, just change the rotation around so that your so kids aren't always getting the short end of the stick. So make sure the rotation starts on a different day and, and just keep changing it so that everyone gets good lessons all the time. Sure. Uh, That's okay. I, I, I'm to read the book. Please don't tell me to say anything or I'd like to say something. Um, we, we have a couple music ed folks here, and so I wanted to open the floor for questions uh, from the students, and then anyone else who has questions for our panel. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it sounds like you've had amazing experiences. Um, so, my question is dealing with parents and administration, and how the MAT, how the MAT, if they prepare you for that, because that's a real thing we have to handle. And if you got that experience in the schools, I yes. think. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're working. Yeah, yeah. 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 Katie. <laughs> Real life. Of course you do. I've had all sorts. Especially, I didn't work a ton with parents. I did some uniform fittings at the elementary level. I met some parents on field trips at, in, at the at my middle school and high school placements. But right, until I got to Spring Ridge, I didn't deal with parents. You don't, as a student teacher, typically, because you just don't have to, and you're not expected to, and you, you may not even want to. Um, <laughs> but... But how did you gain the, the, the awareness? I mean, it's not like you were in a bubble when you weren't allowed no, to watch. No, and I guess <laughs> just... You have to be aware that even though you have their student, they may have no idea what's going on in your classroom. I had a parent emailed me last night and said, they're not changing clothes on costumes for my dress rehearsal this coming Monday. Do they still have to go? And I said, yes, ma'am. It's still a dress rehearsal, even though they're not actually changing their clothes for that day. But, and, and I, you know, and you do it politely because I have to understand that parent has, may not have ever even heard the term dress rehearsal before, even though her student has. Um, and you just kind of have to keep in mind that they're on a different side. Mm -hmm. They don't they don't see what you do with their student and they don't they don't necessarily comprehend in a music classroom what you're doing at all. I've had all sorts of the, the first round of emails I got was after my my first concert uh, at Spring Branch and I got questions about my grading policy because I severely docked some of my students grades for their audience behavior and I got some parents that were very unhappy about that because they were used to their students getting hundreds for the concert and I said no I emailed you the parents and I passed out these expectations to your students and I said I know that's not been the expectation I think concert etiquette audience etiquette is a big part of a performance aspect it's not just what you do on stage and I said I'm not changing their grades that's not my policy and I'm their teacher right now and that was the first big challenge I had to face with parents communication I think <clears throat> Go I was gonna say I think in the music classroom you get that a lot with grades where mm -hmm. parents are like it's music, they get 100, right? <laughs> like, no, yeah. Um, no, we actually 
actually and I was <laughs> talking about how at my middle school placement I saw a lot more legitimate grades being given out where the kids are working towards it but that etiquette grade is still so important it's a teak oh um, yeah. it is so that's part of it but as far as interacting with parents because we bounce around a lot we don't get as much interaction with parents we're not there like if we were in the regular education classroom they have to email parents and do all kinds of stuff but a lot of it is observing what your mentor teacher does and taking the opportunities can I sit in on these meetings can I read the emails that you're sending well what are you going to talk to the parents about can I listen to the phone calls um, and just see what they're saying and what they're doing and it is a lot of understanding especially you have some kids who just don't tell their parents things. You can send out papers and things, and yeah, the parents aren't ever going to find out. So you just got to be really good at keeping what I found, keeping that line of communication open and being really good about responding and being mm -hmm. respectful and just, you know. Mm -hmm. My biggest, oh, I'm sorry. No. My biggest um, parent interaction was always with the crazies. Because, <laughs> and I think it's because if you mean you, that in an endearing way. Of course. Yes. Um, <laughs> when, uh, when a parent is in their right mind, of course they want to be very involved with their, with their child, but, uh, but they understand that you're the teacher. They understand that you have these expectations set and they want their child to adhere to those expectations. Um, but then there are some parents who uh, really want to take any opportunity they can to try to sue the school. And, um, and so you have to be very careful with their child who happens to also have autism and uh, make sure that you are treating them up to standards with their IEP and, uh, and make sure that you don't do anything that could upset their parent um, in order to getting you in trouble at all. Um, but however, there's also, there's also administration that can sometimes not be crazy but have their own agenda. Um, for example, in my elementary setting, my mentor teacher told me of a time when she gave a grade out to a student, and it wasn't an E, and uh, a parent complained to her administration, and her administration told her to change it because he didn't want the parent to be mad at them. Um, so that's obviously not all administration, and that's obviously not all parents either. You, you just have to be very aware again of where your students are coming from, what their home environment is life at, like, and, um, and you have to be aware that you're going to face challenges and that not everyone is going to agree with you, but did most all, people will. And did all of you have opportunities to observe your mentor teachers uh, in situations, you know, getting back to the question um, of how the the MAT year prepares you for the non-teaching elements of being a professional educator. And so, uh, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think part of it is being proactive yourself, mm -hmm. um, especially as far as administration. If you go out of the way to introduce yourself to them, not just waiting for your mentor to introduce you. Um, and it, at Langley, it, was, it wasn't even a question. Like, as soon as I walked in the door, everyone was like, oh, who are you? And it was just so welcoming. Um, whereas at Southwest, it was a huge school, so I, you know, I met the principal once or twice at a football game. Um, but just, you know, asking your mentors as you go into the MAT year, you know, what's going on? You know, if you know they're having a meeting with a parent, they might not let you sit in for privacy reasons. But just say, okay, what's the issue? Is there something I can help with? You know, just so you know what's going on in the program. And, you know, if the kid's having an issue and you're going to be teaching that class, you need to know. So just be, be proactive and just don't let them blindside you. That's so important though because I know there was one class and I went to teach and I was like, I don't know what's going on with this student, what is happening, and it wasn't until, so I didn't know how to respond because I wasn't sure if it was a behavior thing, if it was something more, if it was they were in a bad mood, so I didn't know how to react and respond, and so you really, and it was afterwards I was like, what, what do I, and she's like, oh, I forgot to tell you, this is what, and so just be yeah. like, is there anything? No, <laughs> you know, it's always just a good question because, yeah, they get they're doing a ton of things too. They're running a program and they have a student teacher all of a sudden, and they might forget because they're used to teaching those kids and they know what they need and they know the expectation and what might happen. You need to remind them that you don't know everything. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, okay, so you have to, okay, so why did you do that? Oh yeah. So like my mentor this past semester, he always like, hey, if I ever just start doing something and you don't understand why, please ask me. Mm -hmm. I get caught up in the moment. And I'm like, all right. And he would let me see the emails that he'd send parents sometimes too. Mm -hmm. So 
And I did talk to parents on occasion whenever they came up to me. Like if they happened to come to the school and I was the one in the room and Chris wasn't there, I was the one to talk to them. And um, it didn't happen very often. So you can't really expect to have a lot of parent interaction, but um, just know that it is coming. Whenever, as a new, as a, <laughs> that it's going to happen as a new teacher, especially. You're, everyone's going to want to know who you are. And, and um, it's one thing that we didn't get as student teachers is all the emails that the teachers get on a daily basis. So um, yeah. learning how to... Eternally thankful. Yeah, but and that's, not, that's all going to change very soon. I'm going to have oh, so many emails, and I just got to learn how to... We all have to learn how to manage our time better. Not only are we teaching, but we're communicating with everybody and keeping good relationships open with everyone. Also, uh, going back to what you said about uh, your mentor teacher telling you to interject and stuff, don't be afraid if you are concerned about how you performed in front of the class mm -hmm. to go and ask your mentor teacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, give me some feedback. Yeah. I want to know. My, <laughs> my mentor teacher didn't usually give me feedback, so I had to learn to really be like, did I say that okay in the classroom? Did I do this correctly? Because if I didn't, she'd tell me about a week later, oh, by the way, that thing that you did last time, don't actually do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that was really confusing for me. So just be proactive, <clears throat> always. That's the I'm looking to speak. You mentioned time management. I think that's what uh, uh, So um, are there other questions? I have a question. Please. So I'm wondering, when you get this fabulous first job and you have this wonderful <laughs> program, how you're going to advocate for your program to your administrators and to the community at large to, to keep your program really strong. Because we have lots of things that are nipping away at our heels with, um, with testing and funding mm -hmm. and other things that are encroaching upon the curriculum. How will you keep your program strong and advocate for you? I know with mine, we just had star retests this week. And I had one student and they wouldn't negotiate. They pulled her out. They changed her schedule. And she won't, she's been pulled out since the, she found out she failed the STAR test and she won't be in my classroom again. But one student, he, his was an issue of a high school credit. And they pulled him out. And I went to them this week and I said, I need him back because I have a concert next week and he's part of it. And I said, you, this is not state mandated. And it, this is a grade for him, a major grade. And I was like, and he's missing out on part of this ensemble. And I was like, I, I want him back in my room after that retest date. And they did. Um, and I, but, but I had to go and say something because they weren't going to send him back to my room mm -hmm. at all. And I said, no, I, I want that student back. And sometimes it's a matter of one student like that, or sometimes it's a lot more. Um, I know since coming into this program at Spring Branch, I've, I just saw my numbers for my sixth grade students coming in next year, and they're about half. I'm looking at about five sixth grade boys that I'm going to have to integrate into an intermediate boys class, which is hard on their voices, mm -hmm. but five sixth grade boys doesn't make a choir, and I wouldn't want to give them that experience. So recruitment is a big part of it, and you can build in a lot of advocating at the elementary level and get them early and get parents really interested in the music programs early mm -hmm. for a program. And I think that starts that early with fifth grade strings programs or the, the upper schools going to elementary schools and getting that interest peaked in, in music early on and keeping our students in our programs is a big part of it. We have to really actively work at keeping them invested. We don't, so we don't, we don't want to push them so hard that they, you know, that it's too hard to learn. We want to make sure they have fun and that they're making music and having meaningful music experiences. But they also get a social aspect. And they what what and strategies, either formal or informal, um, did you observe with your mentor teachers in terms of uh, advocacy of the overall program. I mean, thinking about the constituencies, because you have parents, you have community, you have uh, fellow teachers, you have administrators, mm -hmm. and each of them have a different stake in the quality of your program. And I'm curious what strategy, and again, the formal or informal, you know, whether it was, I know at, at White, many of the strategies are more <laughs> informal, but I anybody's got I think. At the elementary level, and I, it's true at all the levels, though, is making yourself um, a part of the school community. Sometimes we close ourselves off and we're like, we're music or 
special. Um, but going into simple things, eating lunch in the teacher's lounge, being around those other teachers so they can talk to you and see what you're doing and you can talk with them. Maybe not asking if you could skip out on every staff meeting just because it doesn't apply to you. <laughs> going there, showing face, showing that you're part of this community and talking and being around them so they see you're, you're transparent. Um, and being transparent with the parents. Um, we've talked a lot this year about informances and I know at Hebener I missed it, but from Music in Our Schools Week, she invited the parents to come in and sit in on the classroom and see what are their kids actually doing because elementary music, general music has changed so much over the last several years and parents come in and they think, oh, well, when I was in school we just sat and sang. And so to see that their kids are dancing to folk music, playing, singing, reading, um, improvising and composing, they're just astounded. And so when they see that, they're like, wow, mm -hmm. this is way more than I thought it was. And they see this whole other side to it. So transparency with your parents and what's going on in the program, transparency with your administration and the other just faculty in your campus, letting them know what's going on. Um, to build on that, it's just a yeah. huge <coughs> PR campaign. I mean, the, the middle school, you have to perform. You have to uh, find a way to bring your high school down or go to the high school or go to the football game, make face with the teachers, go to all the staff meetings, even though they don't portray to you, sorry. Um, and then in the, at the elementary, we did blogs. We recorded our classes and our activities and our final products of our lessons so that the parents could see and administration could see. We posted concerts, you know, again, promoting our program at the high school. It's very, a, little, a little easier that you have high school football games every weekend in the fall. And then you have all these ways to be visible. But at the time, it's also a challenge because you have 300, 350 band students you know, who are the face of your program in a lot of ways. So you have to show, show the expectation too. So again, this is running this PR campaign saying, you, you know, we're part of something here. Let's show administration that we're a classroom, that we're learning, we're teaching and we're building uh, young individuals into adults. One thing they, really, they do at Southwest that I really liked is they have this program called Game Changers. And the student leaders from all of the major groups on campus, like the band, the football team, um, just anything like that, they have, have a meeting once a week and they say, this is what's going on in the school this week. And so the, they actually got a bus um, to go to our concert UIL performance. And any student that wanted to, could sign up as long as they were passing all their classes they could sign up and go for free miss a day of school and go watch us perform at UIL and they had like we had three rows of students there and so it, it was amazing and then some of our kids will go to like tennis games and we'll play at soccer games just like the drum line and so just being involved with the school community and being involved in other activities mm -hmm. you know I know like as music teachers we have a lot going on in our own programs but realizing that other teachers do things too and going to their activities and going to their <laughs> performances or you know, whatever else is going on, just being visible and being a part of the community is the best form of advocacy that I've seen. I think so. And you're, it helps your students. It, even not just showing yourself to the other teachers and the administrations, but if you show up for your students, if you go to see one of their games, mm -hmm. it spreads. They talk mm -hmm. about it and they say, my choir teacher or my band teacher was there and because sometimes you know after school if they have so many games every week even their parents can't even make you know every game or every show so if you can make it to their stuff it means a lot more to them than it would and especially as music teachers we often get our students for longer I'll, I'll you know we keep them whereas they switch their other teachers but we keep them and so you you already build some of that relationship but if you can take it a step further they talk about it. It's one of the biggest and best ways, I think, to promote your program is through your students doing it for you. Mm -hmm. right. I'm looking at the clock. Um, we should probably wind down. Is there anything that you came into the room really wanting to say that you haven't been able to say yet? Get sleep now. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get some coffee. Uh, and Invest in immune system boosters. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You'll get sick so many times. Just get ready. Stock up your medicine cabinet. Just. I was, no, because no, no, I was more healthy this year. 
than mm -hmm. any other year because your schedule is more regular when you're student teaching mm -hmm. than it is in normal. But you got you go so sick in up. UIL. I okay, so I was really, so really healthy. Every year of undergrad. I was That's really, true. really healthy until the week of UIL. I was so sick. I was so medicated. I can remember walking down the hallway that morning towards the warm up room and being very just very, very sick. I don't remember conducting them on stage. I remember standing in front of them and saying, they're gonna do it, and all I have to do is get them through the three pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I was so oh, utterly yeah. sick. <laughs> the show but, must go on. But you know what, at that point, they're gonna do it however they're gonna do it. I can't, you know, I can't see it for them at that point. All they needed me for was to be in front of them, to know I was there, and conduct them just like I'd been doing it. That's all they needed from me, and that was okay, because that's all I could do. <laughs> okay, anyway. But overall, I wouldn't say that. I think in a lot of ways, as you fall into teaching, your schedule is more regular, and I actually was healthier overall this year than I was in college, like in undergrad. Yeah. Wash your hands frequently. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. especially when working with elementary kids. Oh, you do yeah. not want to know where they sit. You just say like, do this number, and they immediately grab your hand for the folk dance, and you're like, and they want to love you. Or if you, you accidentally you sit down and they like wrap their arms around you and try to kiss you. Oh yeah, what was that one thing that me. you shouldn't say? You shouldn't say, who wants to sit next to me? Yes. Because oh, they'll they all want to sit next. Even to Even if you don't say it, they all flip out like, I want to sit next to you. Yeah. So just take. Take it easy. <laughs> but it's fun. And yeah. you learn a lot. Yeah. And you know, I was blessed we have I have five other students with me and so we had a, a big support group here. Yeah. We were lucky to have each other this yeah. year. Yes. Also yeah. remember, you are the adults in the room now. Okay. Uh, and you're so you the students, you're not the student anymore. You are the teacher. The kids are looking at you and they expect you to know what you're doing and you should expect the same for yeah. yourself. I, I told my kids, um, be, and sometimes it's hard to, for me to remember, you know. I'm the adult in the room, and, <laughs> but and but and that comes in all sorts of little different ways, you know, from how you hold yourself in front of them. Sometimes I'll feel myself, I'll cross one leg behind the other, and it just doesn't look like a very strong stance when you're in front of them. So I just try and be aware of it and not mm -hmm. do that when I'm standing in front of them, unless it's something really informal. If I'm talking, you know, if I'm catching up after the weekend with them, you know, that's fine. But I never, I always wear heels on stage. I always look at least a few levels better than they do. Even when we went to Dallas last year, they wore jeans in their choir shirt. I didn't wear concert black, but I still wore a dress and heels because I'm their conductor. And I have to remember, I'm in charge of them, not just musically, but I'm literally in charge of them. The worst They're thing is to be confused for a middle schooler. <laughs> <laughs> That's happened to me a few times on jean days. It's always on jean days. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, maybe I shouldn't wear jeans on jean days. Yeah. <laughs> in high school, I had to I never could just get away with wearing the jeans and t-shirt. I always had to wear a blazer because I did get the high school student a couple times. Middle, obviously, middle school never happened. I've never been kind of confused for middle school. But high school I did, and I would have to dress better <laughs> than they <laughs> Sorry. Just be yourself in the classroom. Be your professional self. Yeah, be aware of how you're presenting yourself at all times. But your kids can right. tell if you're faking it. Like, and they can tell oh. if you're nervous. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So, the old so, ones. Yeah. so just, right you. just once you you can be nervous all you want before <clears throat> you're actually in front of your kids. But once you're there in front of your kids, just be in the present moment. Just be who you are, and they will learn. They will. And you'll be so prepared by the end of it. You won't even be nervous anymore. After a while, you just it's, it's like a second language. Just it's have like fun. Second nature, really. It's just, all it's, it is is having fun. I mean, I don't know. I. I went to I went to school every day. I didn't go to work, you know. And mm -hmm. I, just, I had fun. I don't know. I have fun. Didn't have sleep, but I had fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, teaching is fun. My hands are this way because I was washing a hundred and eighty tie dye shirt. I was wondering. I was, <laughs> I was like, what does she do this time? <laughs> because our pop show is Tuesday, and so uh, I they, they all did their tie dye shirts, and, but I was the one that had to open all the bags and cut the rubber bands and put them in the industrial washing machines in the athletic wing. That's what I was doing until late last night. Yeah. Yeah. Sometime our, sometimes is sometimes why. Our, our job description entails um, making t-shirts and doing weird arts and crafts uh -huh. things, especially if you're not I had a student ask me, I made a, my students have had a choreographer at school all week this week, 
And so while they are in the classroom doing choreography, I went and got a bunch of butcher paper and I made our pop show posters. And I had a student ask, you know, because with lettering and stuff, where, where did you learn to do that? I was like, well, I guess it's part of just being a teacher. Like, you make posters. <laughs> I didn't know how to answer her. <laughs> it's part of the job description. <laughs> I will add that to the syllabus. You're a lot of poster making. You practice making posters in your classes. Well, I've gone five minutes over my self-imposed ten-minute extension. So um, we should probably we can continue this conversation informally uh, as we shut down. But thank you all for coming, and please give a round of applause.